Okay, good morning all. We've uh, completed our series of basic topics, namely MLPs, uh, CNNs, and regular neural networks. Uh, we've uh, learned a lot about how to train these networks, how to obtain the required uh, input-output relationships from these networks. But what happens inside the network is still a bit of a mystery. So today we're gonna try to peer a little bit into it. What exactly does a network represent internally? So here's what we've seen so far. Uh, neural networks are universal approximators. They can model any Boolean function, any uh, classifier, or any real value predictor. Simple MLPs can analyze static inputs for patterns, or make predictions from them. Convolutional networks can scan inputs for patterns in a shift or even a transform invariant manner. Recurrent networks can analyze time series data for patterns. In every case, the network may have the capability to perform this task, must have, but, have, but must actually be trained to do so from training data. So when we do that, what does the network learn internally? what does it learn to represent? We're going to look at that. So here is uh, here again is what we meant by learning the network. We want to construct a network to model some function. For example, this bivariate function shown by this mesh. We generally assume that the architecture of the model is given. So what we want to do is to determine the parameters of the network such that it computes this function as closely as possible. We typically won't have the entire function. Instead, we'll only have access to a small number of input-output pairs, which are our training instances. And we have to learn the function from these points alone. When we want to uh, want the network to perform classification, then this means that the network must learn to model the classification boundaries between the classes of data. For example, we may provide these red and blue uh, dots where red stands for class one and blue for class zero as training inputs. And the learn network must learn these decision boundaries, which are these double pentagons, but directly from these points. No one is actually giving you the boundaries. Just from observing these points, you have to learn these boundaries. So the function modeled by the net in this case would ideally look something like this figure to the right. The value of the function is zero outside this double pentagon and one inside it. Now, in reality, our training data won't be so clean. We'll have some blue dots on the red side, some red dots on the, on the blue side. And so, as you can say, see, you can't really look at this and draw clean boundaries. Uh, there isn't any uh, definite boundary where you can say this is really uh, where there's a line where everything on one side is red and everything on the other side is blue. So, if you look at it in, the, uh, in terms of the actual function model, the edges of this double pentagon are going to be kind of poorly defined, fuzzy. So in this situation, what exactly does this network learn? To get a better idea, let's look at a simpler problem where the classification boundary is just a, it's just a hyperplane, a linear boundary. The uh, linear decision, decision function in this case is going to be uh, this kind of step function, which is zero to one side and of, of a hyperplane or a line, and uh, one on the other side. This is also called a heavy side function. And we must learn such a function to, to separate the red and the blue dots. But then the problem is the red and the blue dots are overlapping. So no matter how we position the step function, there will be red dots hanging in the air in the blue region, there are going to be some blue dots sitting on the ground in the red region. So it's simply not possible to find this linear boundary that cleanly separates the two classes. Now, to be able to visualize the situation even better, let's wind down to an even simpler one-dimensional example. Here the input is one-dimensional. The function must output a zero, either a zero or a one and a linear classifier in the one dimensional case, as we all know, is a threshold function, which outputs a zero if the input is below a threshold and outputs a one if the input is above the threshold. 
Now in this figure, while clearly the left side of the figure belongs to the blue and the right side of the figure belongs to the red class, in the central region, the uh, domains of the red and the blue overlap. So there is no clean threshold that's going to separate the red classes from the blue classes. And so in this situation, if we provide this as, a, as, as, as training data to our network, then we've seen and seen this in, the, in, in previous classes. The network is a universal approximator. We aren't really restricted to learning simple linear classifiers. So given a network with enough neurons, we can perfectly well end up learning this ugly and uh, possibly useless function. So which actually goes up and down to capture every single data points. Now, going back, so we've discussed this. Here's my first question to you. How many of you think that this would actually be a good thing to do, learning a function of this kind? Raise your hands. Does anybody think learning this? Yeah, no, I, I assume there was a mistake. This is obviously not what you want to learn, right? So this is undesirable for many reasons. So what was the, uh, so uh, also now consider the situation. Suppose I have two or more training instances that have exactly the same X, but different Y's. Obviously, because the domains of the two classes overlap. So it's totally possible for me to have two different training instances which have arrived at the same X, but the Y's are different. So for some of them, the X is zero, Y is zero. For some of them, the Y is one. In this case, again, the data are not separable. So there's no clear separator, but now just consider this example. Let's say, I have 10 training instances with, with Y0 and 90 training instances with Y1. So in this case, what do you think the, the, uh, the uh, value of the function the network learns must be at this, at this X? Must it be one because y, dom because y equals one dominates? Or should we be learning 0.9 because that is the average? Which do you think makes most more sense? Anyone? Over here, responses. It should be one. One why? So uh, because most of the samples are. Most of the samples are one. What about point nine? Red. Right. Which yeah. would, would, would point nine make more sense or would one in this case? 0.9 might make more sense because it would indicate our confidence of how often the things will be classified as one. Exactly, because from 0.9, you can always derive the one. You know it's more than 0.5. Whereas when I go up to one, that information is lost, right? So, so 0.9 is more informative. That's my claim over here. Now, uh, let me take a poll. Raise your hands if you think 0.9 is better than one as an, as, as an ideal output in this case. more than half the people in class, which by the way is reduced to the only 86 people in class. Anyway, now here's another question. Uh, clearly 0.9 is more informative. Raise the lower your hands, please. There are more raise your hands questions. Uh, so now suppose, why does 0.9 make sense? 0.9 is in fact an estimate of the a posteriori probability of class one, given that X takes this value. So it's literally telling you that when X takes this specific value, then 90% of the instances of X, which you know, instances where X takes this value have a Y value of one. So 0.9 here is an estimate of the a posteriori probability of Y given X. Is that making sense to everyone? Raise your hands. Again. Half the class, half the class is asleep, that's okay. Uh, anyway, 
Now, here's my next question to you. Suppose all 900 instances were not exactly the same X, but they were perturbed with respect to each other by say 10 raised to minus 17. So no two are identical. They're all very close to one another. And uh, some of 90 of them are, are uh, one and 10 of them are zero. In this case, should we suddenly have the function begin going up and down randomly or should we still be, uh, you know, would it still make sense to output a 0.9 in this general vicinity? Which one makes more sense? So raise your hands if you think 0.9 still makes more sense. So there you go. I mean, most of you agree, right? So clearly, uh, it's it. The, you don't need things to be identical. Even if things are slightly off, you still think 0.9 makes more sense. So how much off will you tolerate before you want things to change? Now, that is a question we have to ask ourselves. So let's think, uh, let's look at this a little bit differently. At each location X, let's say we are looking at a small window around it and we plot what fraction of the training instances in that window have an output value one. So what fraction of them are red? In this window, there are no red values. So the fraction of output instances with, with, with y equals one is zero. As you keep going forward, it remains zero. And then you begin encountering some reds. So the fraction of uh, instances in the small window around the current x where the output is one begins to go up. And eventually, uh, it's going to have this kind of a shape. So at each point, what you're really plotting is the fraction of instances within that window, which has the value one, which is the same as the average Y value within the window. Because uh, if you just summing, if you, if you sum the Y values for all of the training instances in this window and divide by the sum, that is going to give you as many ones as the number of uh, uh, training instances which are uh, which have y value one divided by the total number of training instances within the window. That's just going to be the fraction of training instances with y value equals one. So this is the kind of curve you will get. And so uh, this average that you get is going to change smoothly from zero to one as you go from left to right. At the extreme left, all of the training instances will have output value zero, class value zero, so the average will be zero. As we go from right to left, first a few, and then an increasing number of training instances are red, and they will have class value one. So uh, there are average, so the uh, average begins to increase from zero and smoothly goes up to one. Any questions? Questions, anybody? Kushal, are there any questions? No, there are no questions right now. Okay. Fine. Nothing in the chat. So, and can anybody suggest a function that actually captures this shape? Sigmoid? Yes, a sigmoid, right? So that's your classic sigmoid. This is your sigmoid. This does, it has exactly the kind of behavior that you want, that, which is why we go with the sigmoid. As you can see, that is one over one plus e raised to minus uh, affine combination of affine function of x. Now look at this, when X is a large negative value, then minus of, assuming both weights are positive, when X is a large negative value, minus of minus infinity is plus infinity, Y e raised to infinity is infinity, one over infinity is zero. So this term, this function is gonna to go to zero when X is a large negative value. When X is a large positive value, E raised to, this, this term within the parenthesis is gonna be a large positive value you end up with e raised to minus infinity, which is zero. So one over one plus zero is one. For large x's, this is going to become a one. And in between, it's going to change smoothly from zero to one. So this exa has exactly the kind of behavior we want. And by controlling w0 and w1, we can control how fast it, go how fast it goes up from zero to one to make it appropriate for our data. And so uh, the sigmoid, captures the kind of behavior we wanted. It actually captures the posterior probability of the class one given the input. 
Now, a one input sigmoid activation perceptron is basically just this logistic function we just saw. So this, this, this uh, uh, perceptron captures the a posteriori probability of class one given the input. And that was for one dimensional data but it also holds for multidimensional data. If you have multidimensional data that are not linearly separable, like in this case, here too, uh, rather than a step function, a logistic function would be more appropriate because it models the a posteriori probability of the class given the input. So the logistic function is going to look something like a sheet of this kind. It's going to, uh, uh, you know, I don't know, can you guys see this piece of paper? It's going to be something like this, right? That's your logistic function. Can you see this? Is it visible on the no. camera? Yeah. Yes, no. No. Oh it's my God. Yeah, right. Something like that, maybe. Right. That's your sheet. Okay. I'm assuming you can see it. I can't do any better than this. And so when you train the function, what you're going to do is you're sort of increasing or decreasing the stretch and finding the rotation and the position. I don't know if you could see what I was trying to show but I'll assume you did, right? okay. And so the, uh, uh, so in this case, the uh, logistic function is going to look, it's, it's going to be one over one plus p e raised to minus of an affine function of the inputs. It will be this smooth curve, like a sheet which goes up from zero to one. It can be rotated in any direction. It can be positioned anywhere. And this can be stretched or shrunk so, so that the rate of increase changes. And when we learn the, para the parameters of the network, when you learn these weights, you're learning the stretch and the uh, learning to stretch it and learning to rotate it. And when you learn the bias, you're learning to position it. And this function will capture the, the, the uh, uh, a, a posteriori probability of, of, the, well, of class one. Now, again, this is a continuous valued function. So, but then if I decide, if I, if I want to make a decision, is the output class one or not? Then what I will typically do is to compare this output to some threshold. And if you look at the locus of all of the points that have the same value y as this threshold, that locus is going to be a line in this case, or more generally a hyperplane. So although the function itself is curved, if you compare the function value to a threshold, that boundary is going to be a line, which is why this is a linear classifier. The boundaries are always linear hyperplanes. And now when I want to train the model, what I would be done, what, I, what, what would happen? So is this clear to you guys? Raise your hands if this is clear. That number is improving, 53, all right. So now to train the model, you're going to be given many training instances of X, Y pairs, which means that you're going to be given in each training instance, you'll be given the input X and the target output Y. And our job is to learn the weights and the biases. These, so uh, you want to learn these parameters such that the, the, the logistic function gives us the best uh, uh, estimate of the a posteriori probability of y given x. So you want to learn the w0 and w1 that gives us the best, uh, the, 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 the best guess for p of y given x. Now, uh, I'm going to, to show how we do this. I'm going to make some minor modifications. First, instead of using a one zero label, I'm going to use a plus one minus one notation like we did in the case of the, uh, of, of the perceptron. And this is just for convenience, just for convenience. Now, so we saw this logistic function to the left. The, uh, assume that I have, my classes are now, uh, y is either plus one, or minus one. So the probability of y equals one given x was given by one over one plus e raised to minus w zero plus w one x. So this, this function had this shape, right? 
Now, the probability of y equals minus one given x is clearly one minus one over one plus e raised to minus w zero plus w one x. And so moving this up, this is going to be uh, one plus e raised to minus w zero plus w one x minus one divided by one plus e raised to minus w zero plus w one x. These cancel out. And so uh, writing this down, this is going to be e raised to minus w zero plus w one x divided by one plus e raised to minus w zero plus w one x or dividing both sides by multiplying both the numerator and denominator by e raised to plus w zero plus w one x. I can multiply both by this. This gives me one over one plus e raised to plus w zero plus w one x. So, did everybody get how this um, get how we got this formula here? Raise yes. your hands. Yeah, it's easy, right? Nothing fancy. So, assuming you all got it, this red plot is the probability of y equals one given x. The blue plot is the prob probability of y equals minus one given x. And if you look at the two formulae. The only difference is the sign of this affine term that is exponentiated. So uh, when y is one, it is e raised to minus of this term. When y is minus one, it's e raised to plus of this term. I can write these two jointly uh, in, a, in a single formula as one over p of y given x is one over one plus e raised to minus y of w zero plus w one x. And so you'll see that when y is one, it gives you this formula and y is minus one, it gives you this guy, right? And so now I, uh, we have these training data consisting of input output pairs, where x is our vectors and y is our binary. They take plus one or minus one values. The uh, total probability of my entire training data is just going to be the joint probability of all of my training instances. And assuming that these training instances are independent, then this is going to be a product over all of the training instances of the joint probability of X and Y for each training instance. And using Bayes rule, P of X comma Y can be written as P of X times P of Y given X. So this, the to total probability of the training data is the product over all training instances of the product of the input x for each training instance times the prob pro the probability the product of the probability of the input x for each training instance times the a posteriori probability of the class given x. And how did we model p of y given x, guys? What was this? Anyone? What was p of y given x? Logistic. It's the logistic. I've written it right there. You're supposed to be able to see the screen and answer me, right? Uh, when I ask you questions, the answer is usually on the screen, as you know. Anyway, so this is going to be how we have modeled the total probability of the training data. And now, uh, so I can, uh, so here it is again. This is the total probability of the training data as we modeled it. And I can separate it out. I can separate out the probabilities of the inputs and the probabilities, a posteriori probabilities of the outputs. So this term is simply the product over all of the inputs of the probability of the input, uh, the probability of all of the product over all training instances of the probability of the input times the product over all training instances of the a posteriori probability of the output given the input. And the log likelihood, if I take the log of this probability, this term is going to come out as a summation or a summation. All the products become summations, right? 
So the log probability is the sum over all training instances of the log of the probability of the input plus the summation over all training instances of the log of the probability of the a posteriori probability of the output given the input. So this is the total probability of the training data. Now, so uh, here is the, uh, actually let's work off of it. Let's go ahead. So this is, here's the formula for the total log likelihood for the training data. Is the sum of the log probabilities of the x's minus the sum over all inputs of the uh, log of one plus e raised to the, uh, this affine term. Anyway, let's work off of this. Now in standard statistical models, so what we have seen is that this is really a statistical model, right? The logistic function is kept computing, is modeling p of y given x. And so in standard statistical estimation, when you have any kind of probability distribution model, Suppose you have some data over here, just for just to keep things clean. Let me call this, this let, let me call these data, say, uh, Z. So typically you would have some kind of a parametric model with the parameters theta, right? And so suppose you're given a collection of training data. Does anybody recall what was the, the, the estimation, standard estimation procedure that you use to learn this distribution, parameters of this distribution such that it best represents this data? How do we do this? Anybody remember? Maximum, Those of you, likelihood. maximum likelihood. What is that going to be? It's going to be arg max over theta, right? P of log of P of C given theta. This is your standard maximum likelihood estimator, right? I, how many of you are familiar with this notion? Raise your hands. I'm assuming some of you are not. So uh, we're gonna see this again in the next couple of classes. We're gonna see it a lot when, when we begin talking about variational autoencoders. And we'll spend some time on it. Our VAE lecture may stretch if that is the case, okay? So now in our case, what this means is that uh, our sigmoid, what, what were the parameters of our logistic? Anyone? For the, for the w the the bias and the weights correct yeah and so what we really want to do is arg max over w0 and w1 of log of this is the entire training data this is not just individual training instances this is where by the training and training data i mean including including input and output right this is what we want to do which is arg max over these w's summation i log of p of x i and what was this guy plus summation i log of p of y given x i right you guys with me here so far yes no yes well, you are speaking for the entire class, but I'm assuming you are, okay? And this first term is not a function of the parameters. This is just the probability of the input. There's no theta here, right? This is not a logistic. So I can ignore this. Are you with me? Yes, no. Raise your hands if you're with me. This is R max W summation I log of P of Y given X. You're getting rid of the P of X term because of the it's now it's not needed to maximize the, the function, correct? 
Exactly, cool. right? And this is the same as arg min over w minus of summation i log of p of y given xi. Correct? If I flip the sign, I need to find the minimum. Yes. Right. And which is basically the same as our min over w plus minus of summation over i log of uh, what was it we had? Yes. Log of the logistic. Right? Because this was this is our logistic. And you guys are familiar with this. What is this function here? What was what was this? Negative log likelihood. There's a negative log likelihood, but in the in your neuro in your I in your uh, uh, in your neural network training, what was this? Loss. Minimizing the loss. This is the cross entropy loss, right? This is exactly the cross entropy loss because you take the output. What we were doing, this is y. Let me let, let me call this. Uh, I'm abusing notation, right? For every training instance, we were taking the uh, log of the output of the output, and we were doing an argmin w, and this was our cross entropy loss. Correct? This is the standard cross entropy loss. Everybody is been using all along. Yes or no? Yes. Right. When you take the derivative, it becomes minus one over y, right? So raise your hands if you see that this is just minimizing the cross entropy loss. And so, yeah, I'll just skip the arithmetic here. What happens is this is finding the maximum likelihood estimate of these parameters is identical to minimizing the kullback leibler divergence or the cross entropy loss between the desired output y and the actual output. Is that making sense to everybody? Again, raise your hands if this is making sense. Okay, good enough, right? I'll take this. And it can't be solved directly, so we need gradient descent. Now, what about this case? This was for a nice linear, you know, uh, this was where you had this uh, one dimensional case and you have a linear classifier. What happens when you have something like this, which is not a linear classifier? So in this case, uh, uh, you know, we just saw a logistic function, which is linear, but here the boundaries are nonlinear. And they're not simple hyperplanes, but much more complex. Now, to understand what's going on here, let's first consider the separable case where the red and blue dots are, clean, are cleanly separated by some boundaries. So this is, you can get this double pentagon, which is going to be the figure to the right. And uh, let's assume for now, that we have a perfectly composed net for the network for the problem. So we have one subnet, which composes this pentagon, one subnet, which composes this pentagon, you're plotting the two. So you have a network whose structure is capable okay. of modeling this problem. Yeah. We just have to learn the parameters of the network. So now, if we, are, if we are using a threshold or a sigmoid activation, then this final perceptron what kind of classifier is this final perceptron? If it's got a sigmoid activation, anyone? Is it a linear classifier or a nonlinear classifier? Uh, still a linear classifier. It's still a linear classifier. Just because I added this network doesn't change what this perceptron does. So if this perceptron is doing a perfect job of separating the red and the blue dots, 
then what can you say about the inputs to this perceptron in response to these guys? Are they linearly separable? Yes. Yeah, it should be. Now this perceptron operates on the outputs of this layer, correct? Which means that, so if the net network is perfectly classifying the red class from the blue class, uh, and it, it means the, this, this perceptron is perfectly separating the red and the blue classes, which means that if you look at these outputs, if I call this Y1 and, y1 and this Y2, the output of the, the penultimate layer of the network, the second to last layer of the network, that is, if you just passed every training instance through the network, and then measured, just read off these Y1, Y2 values. And then you plotted all of the training instances, the Y1, Y2 values for all of the training instances in the Y1, Y2 space, the training instances must be linearly separable. If the training instances are not linearly separable, then this guy is not going to be able to perfectly separate the blue from the red. So uh, what this means is that uh, uh, this network, this entire network, I can think of it as two components, this final linear classifier, which operates on the output of this portion of the network. And so the overall network has two parts. The first is the output linear classifier, which is, a, and the second is the rest of this network from the input until the penultimate layer, the layer just before the output. And this portion of the network is just a very complex transformation that transforms the input data with all of its ugly classificated, uh, ugly complicated decision boundaries in such a manner that by the time the data arrive here, these transformed data are now linearly separable. So this, you can think of this portion of the network as a feature extraction module that derives linearly separable features from the input that the final linear classifier can operate on. That's cool. And in fact, once you view it this way, then you can view, you know, so once you realize that what this portion of the network does is to simply transform these classes such that they now become linearly separable over here. Now, if you have a linearly separable features at this point, uh, you can use a logistic function, but can you think of any other linear classifiers that I could put out here? What are the linear classifiers are you guys familiar with? SVM. SVM. You can just plug in pretty much any classifier over here. You could even uh, you could even plug in an SVM, right? So you can think of, uh, in fact, uh, here's something you could do. You could just train this network using your standard cross entropy loss. And then once you're done, you've got this feature extractor, which makes the classes linearly separable. Then you can go ahead and just extract features using this portion of the network and plug in an SVM on the top and it should work just fine. It might even work better than the net basic network itself. Uh, Kushal, there's a poll over here. Can you post it? Sure. Okay, you have five seconds. All right, stop. Obviously both are true, right? Uh, this is basically what we, the portion of the network until the second to last layer is basically a feature extraction module that extracts linearly separable features for the classes. And the output layer can only perform well if the rest, the, if, if the, feature extraction portion of the network uh, actually makes the classes linearly separable, right? Now, 
So moving on, any questions, guys? Questions? Yes, no, no, okay. Now this is true, not just for this ideal architecture, which we know can capture this decision boundary. If you have any sufficient architecture for the network, not just the optimal one, like, you know, I just add these extra connections, this architecture is sufficient for this problem then uh, if the architecture is capable of classifying the data, then it means that when it's properly learned, the portion of the network until the penultimate layer is just a feature extractor that makes the classes linearly separable. And so that the final uh, linear classifier can classify it perfectly. If the network is insufficient such that it's not possible for the net to classify the data perfectly, then we saw what this means. So maybe I'm missing some of these neurons. What do you think will happen in that case? Anyone? <clears throat> Anybody? What will happen if the network's architecture is insufficient? A linear classifier may not perform well. The linear, it's not going to be able to classify the data because this, uh, the architecture is insufficient. But what will happen is that this network will try to continue to make the classes linearly separable. It's just not going to do a perfect job. And you can still have a linear classifier on top. Does that make sense to you guys? Does it mean that even if at the beginning the, the, the extraction is not sufficient, but it finally you will extract the, the sufficient features? Yeah, you will extract the features which are no longer linearly separable, but they are, it's going to try its best to make them separable. And obviously this guy is not going to do a perfect job, but it's going to do as good a job as it can, right? Is it guaranteed is, yeah. that it's going to improve the separability of the data? Is it possible that it can make it less separable? Uh, it's the job, the way, because you're starting with a linear classifier, it's going to try to make the classes linearly separable. You cannot make it less separable than it already is. Okay. On the training data, we're not speaking of how it generalizes to test data. But it's not guaranteed to be linear separable, right? Yes, if, it's, if, if, your, if your architecture is not insufficient, it's no guarantee that it will be. Again, in the input space, they are not linearly separable, right? We are speaking of linear separability out here. And yeah. so if the network architecture is insufficient, it is not going to be linearly separable out here, but it's going to be, it's definitely going to be far more linearly separable than this one in the sense that if you apply a linear classifier here, the error is going to be much, much, much smaller than if you apply a linear classifier here, but it's not going to be zero. Does that make sense? Yeah. Okay. And so, Mathematically, uh, for the network with a sigmoid or a, or, a, or a softmax output layer, the network output here is going to be a logistic function computed over the space of the vice because that's where the logistic function is being applied, correct? And uh, where is the output of the feature extraction portion of the network? I can call this just f of x, this feature extraction portion of the network f of x here is this network, which is a nonlinear transform of the input space into the feature space, such that the classes are maximally linearly separable and the final logistic operates on these separated features. And so uh, what does this mean? This means something very interesting. I should have actually added this in the slides. This, what is Y computing? What is this final logistic computing? Given the given the vice, anybody remember? Uh, an or. It's computing the a posteriori probability of the class given y, correct? We just said this. So, yes. so we just said this here, that the logistic function is computing the a posteriori probability of the class given the input to the logistic. So over here, uh, this portion of the network, uh, wait, wait, wait. so this network, this, this logistic is computing the a posteriori probability of the class given the vice. 
but the transformation from the input to the Y space is deterministic. If there's no noise over here. So what this guy is computing is the a posterior probability of the class given the input. Did that make sense? Yes. Right? So what does maximize, so what is a network now actually computing? And what does your training using cross entropy loss actually achieve? In this, in this context? Well, I don't know if the, I assume my question was sufficiently, uh, was not uh, uh, precise enough. Let me give you the answer. So this network, the entire network is a statistical model that just learns to compute the a posteriori probability of the classes given the input. That's all it does. And when you train the network using uh, cross entropy loss, what kind of training do you think that is at this point? Anyone? We just said it here, right? This guy here. What, what, what sort of training was this? Minimizing the negative log likelihood. That's a maximum and maximum likelihood loss right? training, right? Yes, yeah. So when you train the network using to minimize the uh, cross entropy, you're basically training a statistical model that captures, computes the a posteriori probability of the classes given the input. And the entire training process is in fact, just simply maximum likelihood training. Does that make sense to everybody? Raise your hands. Okay, so uh, the reason I'm in, uh, I am uh, emphasizing this is that we tend to get lost in the weeds with all of the details and often miss what it is we're really doing. Regardless of how you're doing it, if you're minimizing the cross entropy loss, you're performing maximum likelihood training. If you're minimizing any other loss, that's no longer maximum likelihood training, but you're still learning a statistical model that computes the a posteriori probability of the classes given the input. So a classification MLP actually comprises, and this holds regardless of whether you're training a, a single class classifier or a multi-class classifier. I'm just using a binary classifier as my example over here. So a classification MLP actually comprises two components, a feature extraction network that converts the input to linearly separable features or nearly linearly separable features and a final linear classifier that operates on these almost linearly separable features, right? Uh, Kushal, there's a second poll. Can you post it? There's a poll, guys. You have 10 seconds. Okay, stop it. So the first, the second, and the last one are correct. And the rest of, and the third one is, uh, is, is, is incorrect. Uh, you don't need, uh, uh, you don't need the data to be linearly separable for any of what we just spoke to, to uh, hold true, right? Anyway, continuing. So we've seen what happens. This does some transformation, and this is a linear classifier that, uh, that operates on the data. But what happens inside this portion of the network? That isn't entirely clear because the network itself is kind of automatically learned. And so, it's, uh, you know, its behavior isn't immediately obvious, but there's a nice little hypothesis which says that uh, 
what there's something called the manifold hypothesis, which says that the, that for any classification task, the data, if they're separable, are lie on some nonlinear curved surface of the uh, input space, where if you consider this the, the structure of the surface, then within that surface, they are linearly separable, although they're not linearly separable in the entire space. So if you follow the surface, the classes are separable, but not within the space itself. And so this portion of the network just tries to uh, tries to uh, straighten out this surface incrementally. Let's, let's uh, take a look at how this happens here. This is a little example. Here, this is a two-dimensional example. What we've done is we've generated a lot of training data with a circular decision boundary. And you're gonna to try to train this network, which is just simply one hidden layer with three tan, tan H neurons. And it's going to try to learn the circular decision boundary. Now remember how the neural network operates. It starts off on the input data here. And then the first thing it does is it, there's a linear layer, right? It computes a weighted combination of these inputs. And this output is three-dimensional. So when you do a linear transform of a two-dimensional space into three-dimensional space, what you will get is that you're going to get a two-dimensional plane in 3D space. So this sheet is going to end up as this uh, sheet suspended in uh, 3D space. And so when you learn this, these weights, what it will do is sort of figure out how to position and stretch this sheet in this 3D space without actually warping it. Then this tan H activation is going to bend the sky. And it's going, going to get a, a surface which fills the 3D space, which, which occupies 3D space, not just a two-dimensional plane. Then the subsequent linear combination is going to project that whole thing down into a one-dimensional line. And this final guy is simply going to be applying a threshold on that one-dimensional line. So let's see how the training goes. This is just showing you the loss with the iterations. And you can see what happens. As the training progresses, this portion of the network finds how best to position this plane such that when you apply the tan H on this data, the, uh, the blue and the red portions can end up being separated by a hyperplane. Then this one projects these data down onto this line. And as the network learns, the blue and the red data become increasingly separable on this line. And now when you apply a threshold over here, the actual decision boundary you, you get becomes more and more like a circle. So you can see the decision boundary that's being learned as training progresses, and you can see how that changes. If I had continued this training for some more time, this would actually have ended up being an almost perfect circle. So did this figure make sense to you guys? Yes. So as, the net, as you go through the network, the classes become the surface, you know, the, the, the uh, classes become increasingly linearly separable. Here's something for CIFAR, CIFAR 10. This is the input. In this case, I have uh, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven 10, 11 layers on this network. And you can see what happens. Uh, we projected all of the features down to two dimensions for visualization. And you can see what happens, right? As the uh, network trains, this is the law, this is the accuracy. You can see that as you go through the layers, the classes become increasingly linearly separable. And in fact, by the time you get to the ninth layer, they are almost fully separable. And then the 10th layer and the 11th layer just maintain the separability, right? You can see how it's, or here it is in three dimensions. Oh, wait, how do I, this is in three dimensions. I mean, we've uh, done a PCA projection into three dimensions and you can see how it is actually learning to separate the classes out. As you go through the network, the classes begin to separate out. And by the time you're near the 10th layer, you've sort of separated the classes out into, into individual separate regions of the space, such that now a linear classifier can completely separate out the classes. So you can see how the network sort of increasingly increases the separation of the linear separability of the classes. This is what the lower portion of the network does. So 
Yeah. I, I have a question on the previous slide where you're just going through the kind of like the toy example with the um, yeah the circular boundary. So we have the plane and then we put it in three dimensions and then we pass it through an activation function, which is going to like distort it in some way. It's going to it's going to bend it right because if now it's a nonlinear function, so it's going to bend the plane and make it a curved surface. Okay, and then <clears throat> you then project that curved surface back one dimension to over here, right? One dimension. Yeah. Um, oh, okay. So are you just kind of like, are you just kind of like folding the red corners together? Yes, then, that's basically what it's trying to do. It's learning to fold the red corners into the red region and the blue corners into the and the, and the blue center. Into okay. The red, right. And then now it becomes linearly separable. Right. It's very very pretty what it actually does. Yeah. Yeah. As you go through the network, it's nice to see how these things work. Now, when the data are not linearly separable, the boundaries are not linear, you know, more typical setting for classification problems. In this case, again, what this portion of the network does is to transform the data such that the posterior probability may now be modeled by a logistic. And then it's still, uh, so, you know, remember uh, the, uh, the feature extraction layer in the final penultimate layer is trying to sort of well, create some kind of a representation. I'm showing it to our uh, two and one dimensional visualizations, but it's trying to generate the kind of representation where I can actually compute the posterior probability with a logistic function. And so uh, the actual network still computes P of Y given X. For multi-class networks, it will be a vector of a posterior class probabilities. This portion of the network tries to make the classes as linearly separable as possible. It's not always gonna be possible. And this guy is going to compute P of Y given X. And this whole entire training is maximum likelihood training of the network parameters. So questions? Uh, yes, Professor. Yeah. Uh, so actually, we don't care if the data in the high dimensional space, like in the middle of the extract, extract uh, feature extraction layers are linear separable. No, but it's only we are focusing on the last, uh, yes, yes, on the so, final I mean, layer. Because the final layer, final neuron is linear, so is the one that is uh, the linear classifier. The rest of it is just one giant transformation, which sort of increasingly makes it linearly separable. Why? What does happen is that uh, if your network is deep, the classes become linearly separable well before the final layer. That's all. Okay. Right. And of course, there's always this risk that you know everything you say I've said may be dubious because. There's nothing stopping if you if you have, if your network is overparametrized, you could end up learning something stupid like this. So the uh, the uh, there's all because all you, the only guarantees you have are about the training data, and it's not really clear to date how the size of the network relates to whether it's going to learn something nice and decent like a, a posteriori probabilities probabilities or. Uh, a bad model for the data. Here too, it will be computing a posteriori probabilities, but they're going to be bogus. Anyway, so questions? I'm changing gears and I'm going to run five minutes over, guys. It's too bad. Uh, questions? No? Okay. Changing gears. We've seen what the network learns here. What does it learn out here, right? So to this, let, to answer this, let's go back and look at the perceptrons. What, let's look at the individual neurons, okay? First, consider the simple perceptron, which looks at a weighted combination of the inputs and applies a threshold. So here, uh, if, you know, the perceptron has this uh, summation i, w, i, x, i, greater than t. This is your perceptron's activation function. If I put my weights as a vector and my inputs as a vector, then the second, I mean, these are column vectors, right? Then I can just, I can write this term as simply W transpose of X, the inner product between W and X. And so the actual activation of the function is whether the inner product is greater than a threshold, right? So now here is, so what does this actually do? Now, in high dimensional spaces, almost all vectors are the same length. How many of you have heard this term? Uh, heard of this? Are you familiar with this notion that in high dimensional spaces, almost all vectors are the same length? No. 
No? I have not heard that. Can you explain that? First time hearing this. All right. Okay. Yeah. So this, this is easy, right? So consider a circle. The, the uh, volume of the circle, which is the area is this entire thing, right? Consider a sphere now, right? So if you take a small region of, of say, uh, with delta near the circumference and consider what fraction of the area lies within this belt, within this strip. Now do the same for a sphere where you take a small width delta and consider the mass within the shell of that delta and take the ratio of the mass delta or volume, let me say volume delta over total volume in both cases. It's going to be greater for the sphere than for the circle. It's easy for you to check. Right. Because again, uh, this is, what is the circumference? This is two pi r delta. That's going to be the volume over here divided by pi delta squared. Uh, this is going to be uh, four pi r squared delta over four over, four over three pi, sorry, pi r squared. So as you, as, so as you keep working this for any fixed length, if you have an upper bound on the, uh, on the uh, uh, length of the vectors, which in real life you always will, you will find that as this ratio, which is two, has now become three over here. This was two, this has gone to three, correct? When I went from 2D to 3D. You see this? Guys? Yes, no. This is the relationship of. So this is the area within this little strip near the shed, near the near the circumference. The volume in the little strip near the circumference, the ratio of that to the volume of the entire circle. So I'm saying I'm computing what fraction of the volume lies close to the surface. Okay. Within, de within delta of the surface. Does that make sense? That's simply going to be the circumference times delta, right? Or the surface area times delta for the for the 3D. Right. Right. So as you keep increasing the dimensionality, eventually it turns up that in turns out that in very high dimensional spaces, pretty much all of the mass lies at the surface. So when you're going into hundreds or thousands of dimensions, which is the size that we work in. <laughs> if you take the, any average vector, random vector, and compute its length, they're all going to be very close to one another. It's just the way it is. So when I say x transpose delta is greater than delta t, now this is the inner product between x and w, x, x transpose w. So this is saying, and what is the inner product between two vectors? The inner product between two vectors is what x, one w, cos theta, right? So if I say x transpose w is greater than or equal to t, this implies cos theta is greater than or equal to t over mod x mod w. And if all vectors are the same length, you can sort of, you know, just think of this as one constant term, right? Or theta is less than or equal to cos inverse. Does this make sense? Yes. Right. So basically what happens is that you're saying that your weight vector is a representative pattern and the, the perceptron is going to fire if the input lies in a small cone around the weight vector. Does it make sense? Yes, no, raise your hands. Okay, can you repeat that, please? So the weight vector, when you're saying that, when I'm saying that the inner product between X and W must be greater than a threshold, it means cos theta must be greater than threshold divided by the lengths of the vectors, right? Right. Which means theta, because cos theta decreases as theta increases, so theta must be lesser than the inverse cosine of this value. Oh, okay, understood. Right. So which means that you want the input to be within a very small angle 
of the pattern represented by the weights. The weights are the representative pattern that the perceptron is detecting, and the neuron will fire if the inputs lie within a small angle of this pattern. In other words, the weights, the neuron is a, is a uh, uh, correlation filter. The weights represent a typical pattern. What the neuron's doing is computing the correlation between the input and this wave pattern represented by the weights. So here, for example, if you want a two detector in this figure, the weights would actually look like a two. And if your input were like this, this correlation is going to be small. If the input were like this, the correlation is going to be higher. And the neuron will probably fire for this, but not for this guy. So the perceptron is a correlation filter. And so, uh, so this clear to everybody? Yes, no? Yep. Yes. OK. Now, so what happens when you have a larger network? The lowest layers of the network are going to detect significant features in the signal. Something like, you know, suppose I have all of these, you know, if you've seen these old LED displays for digits, then I give you this input, which is one of these grids. And you're supposed to detect if what it's showing is a digit or not. If you build a network, then you'd expect the first layer neurons are going to end up being pattern detectors for different components of this grid, which are characteristic of either digits or non-digits. So for example, you might have neurons, which end up, you might find that neurons capture these, the weight patterns for these individual neurons, which is end up having these little bar-like structures, which compose all of these digits. And uh, they will fire if these patterns are detected. And, and then the next layer is going to sort of uh, combine these to decide if the right combinations of these guys have been found. And then it's going to, and then it's going to, the next one's going to say, you know, maybe these guys actually detect individual digits. And this guy's going to say, if, you know, any input is a digit at all. But then think about this. Here's something. So is this making sense? How the network actually builds up? We've seen this in the past incrementally, right? Yes. Are you guys seeing this? Yes. Yes. Yeah. Okay. Now tell me this. After I've trained the network, right? I, this guy detects say this pattern. This guy detects this pattern. This guy detects this pattern. And this guy maybe detects something to the right. This guy maybe detects something to the bottom, OK? I provide an input. And then I detect these various patterns. Now, once I've detected patterns, is it possible for me to reconstruct this input if it's a digit? Yes. How? Just add another layer. I'm not asking you for the mechanism, just from this. What if you put the together. features back I can together put the patterns back, right? If this guy and this guy have fired and this guy have fired, then I know that the input has this pattern from this guy, this pattern from here, and this pattern from here. So I can actually begin based, I can just put the features that these guys detected back together to construct my, to reconstruct my input. Can I not? Yes, you can. Right. So uh, basically, the signal could be partially reconstructed just using the features that these guys will detect. And it's not going to be uh, perfect because in this case, the network has been trained to de detect digits or non-digits, right? And so you might find that it's only going to detect those portions of the features, those components of the features that are relevant to this decision. And so what you would reconstruct is something that's relevant uh, to that, that are clearly digits or clearly non-digits. Uh, it's not going to be generic, but you get the idea. The fact that these guys detect features means those features can be put back together to reconstruct the input, right? So here, you can't reconstruct it perfectly. It's only going to retain distinctly digit-like or obviously not digit-like features, and the rest are irrelevant and will be lost but you're going to get some approximation to the input. But then I can make it explicit. I can explicitly say 
I want these guys to go back and actually learn to reconstruct the input. This is an autoencoder. An autoencoder learns to, if you have an encoder, which has two components, which learns to detect all the most significant patterns in the input. And then you have a decoder, which recomposes the signal from the patterns. Now let's consider the simplest autoencoder. You have a single hidden unit. And let's say the hidden unit has linear activation. So this guy, now observe what happens over here. Uh, something I wanted to show. When I put this patterns back, so let's go back over here. If I'm going to, this neuron has some weight, right? What did we say about the weight? How does the weight relate to this pattern? Anyone? It's like a correlation matrix. So how does the weight relate to the pattern that it's detecting? It gives it like a particular, uh, I think you mentioned a boundary. No, the weight we said oh. was the pattern it's trying to detect, remember? R right, 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 yeah, yeah. Correct? So this weight is going to detect the pattern. So now, suppose this neuron and this neuron and this neuron have fired. How would I reconstruct the input? Just use the weights of those three neurons. I can just add up. I can basically, so this is going to be W transpose, right? I'm just going to add the patterns that these three guys detected, which are basically just these weights, correct? Does everybody yes. get that? Yes. Raise your hands. Right. Any questions? Did somebody not get it? Question? No. Okay. Um, yeah. Sorry. You're saying just add the weights together to yeah, reconstruct so saying, the end. So I'm saying that this guy, you know, is looking for this pattern, right? How is it looking for this pattern? It has a weight, which is one over here and zero elsewhere. Correct? Oh, okay. In the ideal case. Oh, or in any case, it's going to, it, the weights are the patterns that it's trying to detect. Okay. Right? So when it fires, I know that this weight pattern has been detected. I can just add those patterns back and reconstruct the input. That's basic. That's why this is W transpose. You're adding these things fire, and then you just come recompose the input using the patterns that the neurons are looking for. Make sense? Yes. Okay. So, uh, Professor Bixha, I have yeah. a question. So, okay. I'm just like following up on what uh, Ravneet said. How 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 can you know for sure that the weight uh, will be, will be represented as one in some particular places and zero? You don't. Elsewhere? I'm just using that as an example. But what I am sure is the weight does represent the pattern that the neuron is looking for. Oh, okay. Okay. Right. So. So now. If I have just one little hidden layer, uh, one single hit unit in my hidden layer, the network structure is going to be W going in and the transpose of W coming out, right? And so now suppose I train this little unit to minimize the difference between the input and the output. What will this thing learn, anyone? What's this, what does this look like? Okay, let me actually write it up, right? You're trying to minimize the expected divergence between X hat and X, which is the it's expected the identity matrix. Pardon me? The identity matrix? No, because it's down to one dimension, right? So the, this, the linear activation neuron is, is computing W times X, right? Then the output is computing W transpose times WX. Yeah? Right. So this output is W transpose WX. It's trying to minimize X minus W transpose WX. But now let's go back and look at this in terms of figures. You know that W is some vector, correct? And what, what is the input doing? When I'm computing W transpose X, it's sort of projecting this onto the W vector. It's finding this W transpose X is computing this length as you know. So W times W transpose X is basically this projection vector. Is that making sense? Mm -hmm. 
guys? Yes. So what would something like this? So if I have a lot of inputs and I'm trying to find a single neuron, which is to, which tries to represent all of them perfectly, what I would be doing is compute finding this, this W, a W is a single vector. And it's, going, it's trying to find the W such that when I project all of these guys on to this W, the total error is minimized. What does this look like? PCA. It is PCA, right? This is just PCA. If I have a single uh, linear activation uh, neuron, that's going to perform PCA. So the autoencoder simply finds a direction of maximum energy. All inputs, all vectors are mapped onto a point on this principal axis. It's just PCA. And now here's the thing, right? The output. So if you consider the decoder, the 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 the, uh, the uh, second half of this, the output you have this x going in, x hat coming out, x hat. So let's say the value here is z, right? x hat equals w transpose z. w transpose is is this vector, is the weights vector for the output, which means that regardless of what is computed over here, the output is only going to lie on this line or hyperplane. Is that making sense, guys? Yes. So what this means in turn is that regardless of the input, if I just vary this hidden representation here, the output is always going to lie on the blue line. It's going to lose all of the, there's going to be no fuzz around it. And so this is going to happen even if I have different weights for the output and the input. This doesn't have to be W transpose. So long as I'm learning, minimizing the error between X and X hat, it's going to learn these weights such that the, uh, and these weights represent this line, right? It's going to learn these weights such that uh, the, uh, the uh, scaled version of this, of this weight vector best represents X. So even though these two are independently learned, it's just going to learn to perform PCA. Does that make sense? Yes. yes. Okay. And this also holds if I, if I have multidimensional inputs if I have many hidden neurons over here. If I have several hidden neurons, and I'm speaking of linear activations, then if I have like four neurons, the output is going to be of this hidden layer is going to be a four dimensional vector. The, so the final output X hat is going to lie in a four dimensional hyperplane of the entire space. And when I try to find the Ws and W hats, which minimize the error between these two guys, I'm just going to end up actually performing the finding four component, principal component analysis. It's still only going to perform PCA. And uh, so uh, having, if the activations are linear, the simple autoencoder is going to perform PCA every time. This lower portion is what I call the encoder. It's the analysis net which computes the hidden representation. The output is the decoder, which recomposes the input. And so, uh, this is uh, everybody with me so far. And here, this means so that if I have a network of this kind, which takes some high, let's say some d-dimensional input, and let's say I have three neurons here, and then it goes back to d-dimensional output, the output of the network is always going to be in some three-dimensional hyperspace of the input, which means regardless of what value I feed over here, the output is going to always be in that three-dimensional hyperspace, okay, hyperplane. Now, this is with linear activations. What happens when I have non-linear activations? Now, I think I have a, a poll out here, but Kushal, there's a poll here, I think. Can you just post the poll? Question here. Yeah. Here's a poll, guys. You have a minute, half a minute.
You have 10 seconds. Okay, stop it. Both of these are true, right? Both of these are true. An autoencoder with linear activations, uh, for, this, for those who couldn't see it, an autoencoder with uh, linear activations performs principal component analysis of the input. And uh, then the decoder can output on only output values on the principal subspace of the training data, regardless of the input. And this is kind of important. Now I'm going to run for an extra four minutes and then pause and then I'll finish the class, okay? So now what happens when I have a non-linearity of this kind? When I have a non-linearity, as we saw in the case of the tan H, you actually learn to bend a surface. So when you have a non-linearity in the decoder is going to learn, perform something like non-linear principal component analysis, where now instead of finding the principal linear subspace, you're going to find the principal curved surface that most of the data lie on. And now here is a fact of life that uh, you know data are structured. So if you consider any real life data at all, you're going to find that if you actually plot the scatter of the real life data, they all lie in some close to some lower dimensional surface in the high dimensional space. So you might find that the data all lie maybe near this curve. And if you actually have a nonlinear uh, uh, activations, the network is going to capture these more complicated non-linear surfaces or manifolds that the data lie on. So here are a couple of examples. Here, here in this case, I have 2D input and the data all lie on the on this helix. And I've trained this network. It had seven layers on either side. And just to see one dimensional uh, representation of the in, uh, at the hidden layer. Now, what happens is that these data lie on a curved surface. Do you see that, guys? All of the data basically lie on this helix. And so, so long as I know that the data lie on the helix, one variable completely explains the data, namely the position on the helix. And so what this network will learn to do is that this decoder will learn to learn to generate the structure of this helix, the encoder, must learn to find the position on the helix. And thereafter, regardless of what value I feed the decoder, the decoder can only produce data on the manifold that it has learned, namely the helix. It won't do it so cleanly because in this particular case, where you, because the data are not you know, continuous, they're, all, they're always kind of sparse. Even in this example, what it has learned, and you will see that, uh, so typically what will happen is, I have data lying in a, along a helix, right? So, and I have this network, it's kind of and then out here. The network first learns a value Z here, and this has X, then you get X hat. If I, after training the network, if I vary the value of Z from say minus infinity to infinity, ideally you would expect that the decoder learns that I, to generate this output. And if your training data ended over here, it should ideally continue to produce more of the helix after when you go outside the range seen in the training data. That's not what happens. Uh, what actually happened over here is that it learned a much more crazy structure. It learned this structure starting from here. Then over here, instead of continuing straight on, it jumped to this side and then came around smoothly here and then jumped back here and came here. And then when I continue the Z values outside the training range, instead of continuing to produce a helix, it went off somewhere like so. Or here is an example where we actually tried to learn, this, learn a sinusoid. And so the thing is this decoder over here can now only produce data on this helix. Here we try to learn a sinusoid and the decoder learns to produce data only on the sinusoid but if you take the decoder portion of it and input some Z values here, which are outside of the range computed from the training data, instead of continuing the sinusoid, it just goes off straight, right? So it doesn't generalize beyond the training data itself. Now, 
when the hidden representation is of lower dimensionality than the input, we, have, we call this a bottleneck network, and this performs non-linear PCA. It learns the manifold of the data if it's properly trained. So the key point is this, that regardless of that in, in your input data, in input space, the data lie on some very close to some cur curved surface. And so the, uh, the uh, uh, autoencoder basically learns, the, the decoder of the autoencoder learns to generate data only on the surface and nowhere else. And so now if I learn a complex autoencoder and then I throw away this guy and, and I input any vector over here, regardless of what vector I input, it's only going to produce data on this curved surface. So which means that this decoder has now learned the curved surface on which the data really lie, the training data lie, and when it generates data, it's only going to generate data that which have, uh, which have structure, which are kind of similar to the training data itself. So uh, it ends up being representing something like a source specific generative dictionary. If I just take the decoder, if I input different values over here, what it will produce is going to be uh, similar to the kind of data that the autoencoder was trained on. Uh, I have a couple of examples. I'll stop after these examples. In this case, I've trained this on audio. And uh, here we trained an autoencoder on spectrograms of a saxophone. Then you take the decoder and I've given it an input where this guy is one and all the rest are zero, some random input. And what does it generate? It actually produces a saxophone-like sound. It doesn't produce random noise. It actually produces a saxophone. -like sound. Or if I give it one here and zero else in the other places, produces a different saxophone note. Regardless of the combination of inputs I give it, it keeps producing saxophone-like sounds. Or now this one was trained on a clarinet. And same thing. It actually learns to produce data of the kind that it has been trained on. And so uh, there's this last poll. Kushal, can you do this poll? Yep. That's this one here. Meantime, if you have any questions, guys. So let's stop here. Stop the poll. All of these are true. Right. All of these are true. An autoencoder with nonlinear activations performs nonlinear PCA. It finds the principal manifold surface near which the training data lies. The decoder of the nonlinear A can only generate data on the principal manifold of the training data, regardless of the input. So the decoder you can think of as a dictionary which composes data like the training data in response to any input. Uh, I'll pause the recording here, guys. Uh, I'm going to. So I'm going to show you a very cute little application for this kind of autoencoder. I'm going, to try, I'm going to try to perform signal separation given a mixed sound from multiple sources. I'm going to try to separate out the sources. So this is what is called a dictionary-based technique. The basic idea here is that you somehow learn a dictionary of building blocks for each sound source. Let's say I've got a mixed recording of drums and guitar, people singing, whatever, right? I learn a dictionary of building blocks where if I learn it properly, then every single sound produced by that particular source is basically from the dictionary. Like you can think of a guitar. The dictionary is the set of all notes that that guitar can actually produce. 
And I would do this for each of my sources. So if I had say drums and guitar, I'd learn a dictionary for this guitar, a, a dictionary for the drums. Then any mixed recording, which has both drums and guitar, is basically a, com a sum, a composition of a construction of sounds from the dictionary of the guitar and the drum dictionary. So these two are being composed and they are being added. And so when I want to separate this mixed sound out, what we will do is to say, we will search through these two sets of dictionaries and say, what components of the guitar dictionary and the drum dictionary do I need to extract and combine such that this sound is produced? Once I figure it out, then I can just retain the, the dictionary components of the guitar and that's going to combine into the guitar portion of the signal. I can take the dictionary portions of the drums and that's going to combine into the drum portion of the signal. Now, I'm using sounds as an example, but this kind of this generalizes to other kinds of problems, right? And so I can use this basic mechanism to just separate the, the drums and the guitar out. Let's try to do this here. Here, I'm going to learn one autoencoder for the first sound source and the second autoencoder for the second sound source. Now, here, the decoder now, if it's properly learned, anything it generates is going to sound like this source. The decoder for this guy, anything it generates is going to sound like this source. So now when I have a mixed recording, uh, the mixed recording is my model that, that there was some input which excited the dictionary. The decoder is here. So here, this is a dictionary for, for, say, the, for the first source. This is a dictionary for the second sound source. I'm going to say, that this mixed signal was produced, obtained by first synthesizing some sounds from the first source, some sounds from the second source and adding them up. And how did I synthesize sounds from the source? By exciting with some, exciting its decoder, its dictionary with some input. So the model for the mixed signal is that I had some input which excited the dictionary for the first source, a different input which excited the dictionary for the second source, and then I summed their outputs up and it gave me the mixed signal. So uh, when I want to separate out some mixed signal, I'm going to say, find me the inputs to this guy and the inputs to this guy, such that when I excite each of these two dictionaries using these inputs and sum their outputs up, the sum looks like my mixed signal. So I'm going to uh, minimize the L2 loss between the output over here and the actual data that I got. And I'm going to try to minimize this loss with respect to these inputs. And once I do so, I can do that, right? Backpropagation is actually going to give me, I can use backprop to compute derivatives for even these i's, the inputs to the network. And so now I can actually use backpropagation to actually estimate the inputs to the network. And once I do that, I can just use these inputs and just excite this portion, the, the, the decoder, the dictionary for the first source, and that will give me the sounds from the first source. I can use these inputs and excite the decoder, the dictionary for the second source, and that's going to give me the sounds from the second source. And uh, so I've basically separated this guy out, the, out into these uh, separated signals. So let's look at some examples. Uh, here is a mixed recording. Can you hear that? Can you hear that, guys? Yes. Yeah. Okay. So this is two sound sources and two musical instruments. And what we've done was we've learned one autoencoder, for example, from for one instrument, a separate one for the other. And then we use the decoders as dictionaries. Then given this mixed signal, we estimated the inputs for both decoders. And from those inputs, we actually estimated what the individual decoders should have generated such that when they, when they were added up, we got this mixed signal. So this is the mixed signal. And 
and here's what we got as a separated sound for the first guy. Come on. This is so hard. This is terrible. Maybe I can do this. This I got. Oh my. There's this little gap in the bar and it's locking on to the wrong thing. Okay. I'm gonna have to kill this. Give me a second. Oh my, and now PowerPoint has to fail on me, right? It's gone into spinny mode. That's amazing. I can neither go forward nor backwards. Any questions back? Folks, do you have any questions about what we just did? Uh, is, it, is it possible that the both decoders share parameters? They're different. Uh, so uh, we've learned separate things for the two sources, right? Yeah. I mean, you could make them share parameters, but that's all in the modeling at some point. Okay. Right, the order encoders. I don't think my machine is going to wake up. This is the amount of time Matlab, you know, PowerPoint and Dropbox waste is terrible. Just bear with me for a few seconds if this doesn't wake up in five or 10 seconds, I will just shut the class. So this was literally the final slide. Uh, and so uh, uh, what I wanted to show was that you actually get very clean separation of the two sources. And uh, you can see that the dictionaries, in fact, do actually just learn the characteristics of that one sound source. Uh, it looks like my machine is dead for good. So I'll stop the class, guys. If we if we train a dictionary on, I don't know, every single variation of electric guitar, acoustic guitar, other stuff, and you have like an orchestra playing, you're saying that you can do single source separation of all of those different components, but you need So to again, so there's, a, there's the magic bit, right? In the sense that I showed you that the autoencoder doesn't really generalize too well outside the uh, 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 training data. And so uh, that uh, does end up uh, become a, becoming a problem, but in theory, uh, you should be able to do at least something non-random. Like I, I'm being very conservative, but I'm showing you some examples where the results are clearly not you know, non random, not just merely non random, they're pretty good. And uh, yeah, I think my machine is dead for good. So I'm going to stop the share and I'm going to stop the. Uh, and any other, uh, if you have questions, guys, I'll take them. Otherwise, we'll stop here. Thank you for your patience. Thank you. Thank you. All right. Okay, folks, thank you.